So what I will do in this uh, uh, time is just try to give you <clears throat> an overview of the um, spectrum of developmental anomalies that we see in uh, human ciliopathies. So we're talking about the primary cilium, which really is a multitasking organelle, because it's uh, present on the surface of nearly all cell types, both pre- and postnatally, and it has different functions according to the cell type where it is placed. So, for instance, we'll find it on kidney and bile duct epithelial cells, but uh, also in neurons, uh, and the primary cilium represents the connecting, connects the external and internal segment of photoreceptors receptors, and um, in many tissues, primary cilia have a function of sensors, so they're able to link a number of different stimuli that could be mechanosensory, visual, chemical, osmotic stimuli in order to regulate the cell cycle and uh, cell polarity. But primary cilia are also very, very important in the developing embryo, and really they have a number of important functions. First, we do find primary cilia in the embryonic node, which is this uh, transient structure appearing during gastrulation that is uh, important for determining uh, the left-right axis pattern in the embryo. And it's, um, these are the only motile primary cilia that we have, and the movement of these cilia generate this nodal flow that is essential for the embryo asymmetry establishment. But also, the primary cilium um, actually regulates uh, all developmental, all major developmental pathways do we have. So, for instance, the sonic hedgehog pathway that is uh, really essential for the development of the central nervous system and for limb development, limb patterning, it's completely mediated in mammals through the primary cilium. So, a non-functioning cilium uh, perturbates the sonic hedgehog pathway, but not only that, also the wind canonic and non-canonical pathways and others, TGF-beta, notch pathway, G-protein cell receptor pathways, and so on. So really, you can see how um, alterations in the function of the cilium may have very important and uh, uh, wide impact on uh, embryonic development. Uh, primary cilium is um, um, an immotile hair-like structure that protrudes from the surface of cells, and it's made of a ring-shaped um, axonem uh, that's anchored uh, to the cell body through a basal body and uh, a transition zone that is a zone highly specialized of connection down here that functions uh, as a ciliary gate regulating the in and out uh, of the specific proteins within the cilium. So it is really important, we will see that uh, uh, proteins of the transition zone play a major role in regulation of ciliary function. Also, because proteins have to move up and down of the cilium, we have two important cargo systems, an anterograde transport that is kinesin mediated, and it's made of a complex of proteins um, called EFTB, and then uh, a retrograde transport, moving proteins from the tip to the base of the cilium that it's done in mediated and it's called the EFTA. So with so many different proteins involved, involved with this complexity, it is not surprising that we are uh, really uh, witnessing a, a great expansion in the number of disorders associated with mutations of ciliary proteins that are collectively called ciliopathies. And there are some um, features that we have to bear in mind when we talk of ciliopathies. First of all, this variable severity it can be very mild or extremely severe disorders. Um, the second thing is that there is often a multi-organ involvement, so these are mainly syndromic conditions, although some of them can be focused on a specific organ, but there are clinical red flags. So there are recurrent abnormalities that should make us think of a ciliopathy straight away. And the third important thing is that there is a, a massive, impressive clinical and genetic overlap among distinct ciliopathies, and sometimes it becomes very difficult to distinguish them.
So, um, since uh, um, I've started working on Joubert uh, like 15 years ago, I will start from here, but not only because of this, but also because Joubert syndrome is really paradigmatic ciliopathy because it virtually overlaps with uh, nearly all other ciliopathies and uh, represents a perfect example of these disorders. So we known Joubert syndrome for about 50 years since early description in 1969 by Dr. Joubert in a family of patients who um, were, were three siblings with a non-progressive congenital ataxia. So this is the neurological phenotype that we observe in Joubert. It's fairly unspecific. It's similar to other non-progressive congenital ataxias. You have neonatal hypotonia evolving into ataxia. There is abnormal ocular um, movements, so usually ocular motor apraxia, which is an interesting uh, early sign. And there could be neonatal breathing abnormalities, apneas, hyperpneas that could also be life-threatening. And uh, these children develop, have a developmental delay and later develop a variable degree of intellectual impairment. So uh, this is all fairly unspecific, but several years later, in 1997, Dr. Maria identified on brain imaging what is the pathognomonic sign that allows, uh, that allows us now to make diagnosis of Joubert syndrome just looking at brain. MRI, and this is what we call the molar tooth sign. It is uh, um, a complex malformation of the cerebellum and brainstem, and uh, we have the association of a cerebellar vermis uh, dysplasia and hypoplasia that we can see on uh, sagittal, uh, uh, median, and paramedian cuts here, but also on the coronal because the cerebellar hemispheres get opposed because of the um, hypoplasia of the vermis. And also what is very typical is this uh, thickened and uh, horizontalized superior cerebellar peduncles that you can very clearly recognize on the sagittal, paramedian slices, but also on the axial cut. And this is the most patognomonic cut that, you, uh, that allows you to make diagnosis of Schubert syndrome because uh, these uh, um, superior cerebellar peduncles actually make the roots of what it looks like a tooth. And this, uh, along with this um, umbrella-shaped fourth ventricle and the deepened interpeduncular fossa, really resembles a tooth. So a molar tooth is clearly recognizable. And when you see it, you make diagnosis of Schubert syndrome, regardless of the feature. Phenotype. So the neurological phenotype, we've seen it, is fairly unspecific, but Joubert syndrome can be much more complex than that. And indeed, we can observe a range of uh, developmental and non-developmental defects. There could be retinopathy or retinal dystrophy, and this can range from a very severe liver congenital amaurosis with blindness in the first year of life to less severe and less uh, uh, progressive uh, uh, retinopathies with some conserved vision. There could be um, cystic kidneys uh, or, uh, more often, a progressive condition of interstitial, interstitial tubular fibrosis that is called the nephronophthesis. There could be congenital liver fibrosis, uh, situs inversus, occipital encephalocele, other central nervous system abnormalities like uh, neuronal migration defects. In this case, there is a polymicrogyria, so it's a, a cortical migration defect, optical nerve colobomas. So this is a wide spectrum of anomalies. And uh, these are seen in Joubert, but uh, keep them in mind because they recur in all other ciliopathies as well. Also, we can have a spectrum of oral facial digital defects because uh, um, OFD conditions are also part of the ciliopathy spectrum, and these anomalies can be part of Joubert, but also of other syndromes. So we can have all types of polydactyly, can be postaxial, can be preaxial. You see the uh, bifidus, you know, like enlarged uh, toes here. You can have pre- and postaxial polydactyly at the same time. It can be mesoaxial with Y-shaped metacarps. And also oral anomalies, cleft palate or cleft lip, this tongue amartomas or lobulated tongue that is also uh, found in these conditions, multiple frenulae, 
lingual or gingival and uh, notched upper lip. So, as a spectrum of orofacial defects and other developmental anomalies that uh, can be found in association with the molar tooth. Uh, so, after the recognition of the molar tooth in 1997, of course, an increasing number of patients have been recognized, and with this expanding phenotypic spectrum, uh, it was tried to assign different names to these conditions. So, we had a Baradipap, Coach syndrome, Arima syndrome, and so on. But this is really creating some confusion. So we now just try to call everything that has a molar tooth just Joubert syndrome and uh, uh, make the effort to just describe the clinical association of features that we see in uh, uh, Joubert patients. By looking at the major organs can be involved. So we can have a pure Joubert if the phenotype is purely neurological or we can have Joubert with retina, retina and kidneys, with kidney involvement, with liver and so on. Or we have of um the Joubert with oral fascial defects. This defines one specific form of oral fascial digital syndrome that is type 6. So OFD6 is part of the Joubert spectrum. And um, also there can be additional features that uh, are not really related to a specific subtype. Uh, for instance, there could be some skeletal abnormalities. We will see a possible overlap with skeletal ciliopathies, situs inverses, and so on. This White clinical heterogeneity is mirrored by a very important genetic heterogeneity in Joubert syndrome. And to date, we know over 30 distinct genes that can all result when mutated in the same molar tooth malformation and imaging and variable phenotypes. These are results of our cohort of 350 Joubert patients uh, that have been tested through a targeted um, uh, NGS approach. And you will see that now we reach a diagnosis in about 60% of patients, meaning that there is still a large number of genes to be identified and that we provide diagnosis in just a bit more than uh, half of patients. Uh, there are some genotype-phenotype correlates, or I would say gene-phenotype correlates because some genes are more commonly associated with specific phenotypes. So, and there are some major genes that are more frequently mutated and others that are much rarer. So, for instance, CEP290 is commonly mutated in the cerebello-oculorenal phenotypes of patients that have Joubert with nephronophthesis and retinal dystrophy. C5R42 can be mutated in Joubert with polydactyly or in oral fascial digital, so in full oral fascial digital phenotypes. HI1, it's usually found in pure Joubert with or without retinopathy and so on. Um, so this is, uh, provides some correlations, but of course is not always the same. So there is some variability also associated with mutations in specific genes. These are our data and more or less confirm what has already been published. For instance, these are, this is a paper published last year by Dan Doherty's group and more or less had the same percentage of mutated patients and the same phenotypic associations. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, this uh, wide uh, phenotypic spectrum of Joubert uh, largely overlaps with many other ciliopathies that are diagnosed based on specific features, but uh, uh, for the rest, uh, the, really, the, the, um, the spectrum of multi-organ involvement is very similar in all ciliopathies. So what we really do uh, have to uh, remember first is what are the clinical red flags of ciliopathies. And uh, these are cystic kidneys, um, liver disease, especially congenital liver fibrosis, retinal dystrophy, when we see laterality defects, uh, situs inversus, uh, um, some uh, uh, posterior fossa abnormalities, the encephalocele, uh, polydactyly, oral fascial defects, uh, obesity, and uh, shortening of long bones and short ribs. These are all features that should ring a bell that we can 
we should think about ciliopathies because these facials variably recur in all the ciliopathy phenotypes. And uh, if you want to try to classify them, there is a spectrum uh, going from milder to more severe ciliopathies. Among milder ciliopathies, we have isolated nephronophthesis, uh, senior locken, that is nephronophthesis with retinal dystrophy, and barded beetle. We'll briefly see them, but these are usually um, more benign. Then there are some intermediate conditions that can be milder but can also be more severe. Among them is Joubert, but also the oral fascial digital syndromes and the non-lethal skeletal ciliopathies. And at the extreme end of the spectrum, we have the lethal ciliopathies, including Meckel syndrome and the lethal forms of OFD uh, syndromes and skeletal ciliopathies. So um, there is really a wide spectrum spectrum of severity that we can face. Isolated nephronophthesis, uh, it's important because it's the commonest genetic cause of uh, end-stage renal failure in children. And uh, probably is the only uh, feature that's really non-developmental in these patients because uh, this is a progressive fibrosis, progressive interstitial fibrosis of the kidneys, and uh, it can remain asymptomatic for many years and uh, or just be post-symptomatic post with anemia, growth rate retardation, uh, polyuria, polydipsia, and only become symptomatic with uh, um, either acute or chronic renal failure towards the, towards the end of the first decade of life. Uh, this is uh, the juvenile form. There are some rarer infantile forms where the end-stage renal failure is much earlier, of course, at about two, three years of life. Uh, we usually have small kidneys, so not very enlarged kidneys, with corticomedullary hyperechogenicity, and there could be small cysts. And uh, this can be isolated or associated with retinal dystrophy, with liver fibrosis, or be part of the Birth spectrum uh, or be part of the skeletal ciliopathies and so on, so it's very variable. And um, this is a recent screening where we know 12 genes that were mainly associated to renal ciliopathies, and uh, in this screening, these genes were tested in a group of patients with all types of renal ciliopathies, but the mutation rate remains still very low for renal ciliopathies. So there's Many genes still have to be identified here. Barded beetle, the typical features that distinguish this from other ciliopathies is the obesity and hypogenitalism that is associated with retinal dystrophy and renal cysts polydactyly and cognitive impairment. So uh, this allows you to make the diagnosis, but then we can have uh, other ciliopathy features that are associated. Here, genetics has made more progress. We know 19 distinct genes causative of barded beetle, and these genes account for about 80% of patients. So at the mutation rate, it's much higher. Um, in, on the, at the other end of the spectrum, we have Meckel syndrome. This is a severe ciliopathy that is lethal in utero and is uh, um, defined by the association of cystic dysplastic kidneys. And please note that a difference from uh, nephronophthesis, here we have large cysts and the kidneys are massively enlarged, as you can see from here or here. And uh, so cystic dysplastic kidneys associated with uh, occipital and cephalocele, liver fibrosis, and polydactyly. Uh, so these are the peculiar features of Meckel, but we will see that these largely recur also in other lethal ciliopathies, such as skeletal ciliopathies and the OFD. And uh, 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 on the other hand, here we can have skeletal defects in some uh, Meckel patients and other abnormalities. So as I said, sometimes it is difficult to distinguish the phenotypes. Um, the, we know 15 genes mutated in Meckel syndrome, 12 of them also are mutated in Joubert syndrome, so it can also cause a non-lethal, much milder phenotype. And this uh, um, study is um, 
from a, a, a screening of consanguineous families and the mutation rate was really high, over 90%, but also due to several founder mutations in the Arab population. In non-consanguineous families, mutation rate is a bit lower and it's about 60 to 70%. I would also like to mention those two peculiar conditions that are hydrolethalis and acrocallosal syndrome. These are two ciliopathies characterized by this peculiar association of postaxial polydactyly of hands and the preaxial polydactyly of feet, which can be lethal, so associated with anencephaly or very severe hydrocephaly, or can be uh, more benign, associated with the corpus callosum agenesis, as you can see in these patients here, and a uh, molar tooth-like appearance on MRI. And we know three distinct genes causative for this uh, spectrum, and they also all can cause um, typical Joubert syndrome. Then let's have a look at the oral facial digital syndromes and then the skeletal ciliopathies that are two other major groups of ciliopathies. And in the past few years, there, there's been so much in terms of gene identification and understanding of the mechanism of these. So oral facial digital syndromes, we know 14 different types, but uh, it is very difficult to distinguish one from the other. Uh, as usual in the past, we tried to divide the different syndromes based on little uh, clinical differences, but uh, this is not always possible, especially because of the great uh, clinical and genetic overlap among these conditions. So it is important to, to diagnose an oral facial digital syndrome when you see the association of facial defects that can be hypertellurism, cleft lip, notch upper lip, or nose and chin abnormalities, oral defects, and uh, as we saw in Joubert, multiple gingival frenulae, tongue amartomas, or this lobulated tongue that you see here, cleft palate, abnormal teeth, and digital defects, all types of polydactyly, and brachydactyly, clinodactyly, and so on. So these three features define a diagnosis of OFD, but again, OFD syndromes are ciliopathies, so patients can also present several of the other ciliopathy clinical manifestations, such as uh, uh, kidney disease, we can have cystic kidneys, kidney dysplasia, and so on. Uh, central nervous system uh, defects that can be the molar tooth sign, as in OFD6, or corpus callosum agenesis, meningocele, skeletal abnormalities, short limbs, uh, hypoplasia of long bones, so we do have an overlap with skeletal ciliopathies, and other defects. Um, these are the 14 forms. Uh, only not very many genes have been identified. Uh, this is not even updated. There are a few more genes here in the OFD6 group because this is the group overlapping with Schubert, so we know more genes in this group. But it is interesting to note that also the genes that have been found in three distinct types of OFD syndromes are also mutated in Schubert. So there is an important overlap here as well. And uh, finally, skeletal dysplasia. So this is really a fascinating group of ciliopathies. I will first briefly introduce cranioectodermal dysplasia because it's the one a little bit more different. The main feature of uh, uh, skeletal ciliopathies is the finding of short ribs and a narrow chest that is recurrent in most of these skeletal ciliopathies. And here, again, we have it. You can see like narrow chest with the short ribs, and uh, there is usually associated short stature and short proximal limbs and brachydactyly. And these patients also have this dolicocephaly due to sagittal craniosynostosis. But in this condition, the skeletal features are associated with specific ectodermal anomalies. So we usually have abnormal teeth or hypodontia, the sparse hair, skin laxity, and abnormal nails. 
And again, we can have all the full spectrum of clinical uh, ciliary red flags, renal involvement, hepatic fibrosis, retinal dystrophy, brain malformations. So the skeletal and ectodermal features makes you, uh, allow you to make the diagnosis, but then the clinical overlap is always there. Uh, same for the other skeletal ciliopathies that are what we call the short rib polydactylies. Um, there are a number of these different forms that have been identified based on small differences in uh, skeletal anomalies, but I think the important thing is just to recognize a short rib polydactyly regardless of the the specific form. So you do need to have skeletal abnormalities. Uh, mainly there's, uh, of course, a small thorax, so this constricted thoracic cage with these short horizontal limbs, the short limbs, and uh, very, very often there is this uh, this plastic trident-shaped uh, uh, acetabulum here, and this is variably associated with digit abnormalities, polydactyly, like in these cases, or syndactyly, and again, the full spectrum of organ anomalies seen in ciliopathies. So there can be retinal dystrophy, labor amaurosis, there can be cystic kidney disease, liver fibrosis, there can be oral facial, digit, oral facial features making a phenotypic overlap with the OFD syndromes. So patients can have cleft lip or palate, abnormal teeth, and so on. You see they are divided in two groups, lethal and non-lethal, should we polydactylies. And uh, as I said, there are minor differences. For instance, in one case you have tibial agenesis, in the other case the tibia is better developed, and so on. But uh, this doesn't really make the big difference. The important thing is, of course, that we know a number of genes. These have been identified mainly for jeune asphyxiating thoracic dystrophy, and uh, your next speaker was really giving a major contribution to this field. And uh, here you see that very many genes have been identified in the past few years, and some of them overlap among the distant conditions, but also overlap with other ciliopathies. So, for instance, some of these can also cause uh, isolated retinal dystrophy, nephronophthesis. Uh, this gene here can also cause barded beetle. These other two down here can also cause pure Joubert. So, uh, the message is, of course, that there is uh, um, an incredible overlap among distinct ciliopathies, both clinical and genetic, and we have to uh, accept this because this is a distinctive feature of ciliopathies. We cannot try to split them in separate groups because it wouldn't make any sense. So I'll just try to update this slide that I took from a review now six years ago by adding a number of genes and features, but this still remains very incomplete. But if you look at here, Barded Beetle, Nephronophthesis, of the Joubert, Meckel, short rib polydactylis, there is really Really an incredible overlap. And uh, these are just very few examples. Uh, TCTN3, a gene that was found mutated in this lethal ciliopathy with overlapping features of oral fascial digital syndrome, short rib polydactylism, and Meckel. So this fetus has basically had all this, but the same gene can be mutated in pure Joubert, mild, only neurological, no multi-organ involvement. Same for these other genes, CEP120, found mutated in fetuses with uh, several anomalies with overlapping features of June, of oral fascial digital uh, syndromes, and Meckel. And we recently reported that CEP120 is also relatively commonly mutated, 2-3% of patients with pure Joubert, mild pure Joubert phenotype. And last example is this third gene. This is also an important gene because there is a founder mutation that's particularly frequent in Joubert patients. We and others first reported that it was mutated in patients with a mild phenotype and no multi-organ involvement. And uh, this was later found mutated in patients who had overlapping features of Joubert and skeletal ciliopathies, so overlapping features of Joubert 
and June. And uh, finally, the French group reported mutations in the same gene in a spectrum of lethal ciliopathies, ranging from the hydrolethalus phenotype to a pure lethal skeletal ciliopathy. So there is really a large overlap. And even within the same family, there have been described families in which different siblings have different ciliopathies. So for instance, here, one has Joubert, the other one has isolated the nephronophthesis. Here, one with Joubert, one with Bardot Beadle. We have several families in which one sibling had Meckel, uh, so lethal condition, and the other sibling had Joubert. So um, I think I have convinced you that ciliopathies really represent an excellent example of what we call splitting and lumping, because we have at the same time uh, a condition of splitting, so the same phenotype caused by many different genes, at the same time lumping the same gene causes, uh, uh, distinct phenotypes are caused by one single gene. But this is not a new concept in genetic, and actually it was already discussed by Victor McCusick in 1969, who in uh, this uh, paper on lumpers and splitters or the nosology of genetic disease was already facing this uh, big uh, uh, problem that is still very actual at the moment, uh, talking about uh, pleiotropism and genetic heterogeneity and uh, discussing the fact that geneticists tend to be lumpers and splitters and he even made a cartoon at the time to try to represent the splitting and lumping. So how can we try to explain this? Of course, we do not have an explanation for this incredible complexity, but studying the mechanism of these uh, ciliary proteins will start giving us some insight into uh, to explain this complexity. So how can we explain splitting? One, Of course, one finding comes from the, the study of proteins mutated in ciliopathies and the finding that many of these proteins actually work in big complexes at the cilium. So for instance, most of the proteins mutated in Bardet beetle syndrome work together in a complex that's called the BB some that is localized either at the centrosome or at the tip of the cilium. Or most genes mutated in Joubert syndrome are found at the transition zone and have a function there. So we can hypothesize that if we have a complex, either one or the other protein of the complex is mutated and eventually we expect a similar phenotype or for skeletal dysplasias, many proteins mutated are part of the transport complexes, the EFT complexes uh, that uh, move proteins up and down the cilium. So of course, this explains part of the story, but of course, uh, um, it's not always like this, and there are proteins that are misplaced or proteins in different complexes that cause the same phenotype. Lumping, it's even more difficult to explain because how is it possible that mutations in exactly the same gene, the same protein gives rise to phenotypes that are so widely different. So in some cases, we have some meaningful genotype-phenotype correlates, meaning that if we have, for instance, two, two uh, truncating loss of function mutations, we have a lethal phenotype. And if we have at least one hypomorphic missense mutation, we have a non-lethal phenotype. And there are some examples here, you know, for instance, MKS1, two truncating mutation, Meckel phenotype, at least one missense mutation, you can have Bardet Beadle or Joubert, and same for these other genes and so on. But of course, again, this is not always the case, and we do have genes for which no genotype-phenotype correlates are possible. Functional studies are also helping a little bit to understand this. And for instance, this recent study on uh, C. elegans showed that CEP290, that is a protein uh, giving rise to a wide spectrum of ciliopathy phenotypes, regulates the function of many different uh, modules of proteins at the transition zone. So we can expect that if a protein regulates different complexes, it can also be involved in different phenotypes. But again, 
lots of work till, still to be done. Of course, uh, the uh, most interesting hypothesis is that uh, ciliopathies are not purely Mendelian conditions, but are indeed oligogenic. And besides the mutations in a major gene, we do have genetic modifiers in other genes that somehow influence the phenotypic manifestation of the main mutations. And this has been uh, uh, demonstrated by uh, Nico Katsanis as first uh, pioneering this hypothesis in Bartlett Beetle syndrome and then has been confirmed in a number of the ciliopathies uh, in which it was shown that besides the major mutations, there were additional heterozygous mutations in other ciliary genes that could influence the phenotype. And um, interestingly, when we do large screening of uh, ciliopathy patients, there are very many genes in which we find only one single heterozygous mutation. Uh, of course, it can be just coincidental, it can be part of our baggage of mutations, but uh, it could also be that these uh, HET uh, mutations, some of them are loss of function, are important mutations, can be modifiers of the phenotype. The, to make things most difficult, it was found that uh, these modifiers can even be represented by common variants, so we don't just have to look at rare uh, pathogenic mutations, but even polymorphic variants may act as modifiers, and this has been shown for two distinct polymorphisms with an allele frequency of about 3% in the control population that were found to influence the risk to develop retinal involvement in patients with specific ciliopathies, or for uh, uh, these other, in this other work where variants in the NPHP1 gene influence the risk uh, to have a worse phenotype in patients with Bardet Beetle. And uh, this is also supported by mouse genetics because in different studies it was shown that exactly the same knockout, the same gene knockout produces different mouse phenotypes of different severities according to, gen to the genetic background of the mouse, supporting the fact that this genetic background, the genetic landscape of the mouse may somehow influence the knockout that we produce, determining a phenotype that can range from Schubert-like to Meckel-like in, uh, in the animal model. So uh, it really looks for future studies uh, to try to understand this better. Um, to conclude, a few take-home messages. Uh, the first one is that ciliopathies are not rare conditions. They are rare individually, but put them together, probably uh, more, they are re relatively common. And it is really important to know and to recognize the clinical red flags that uh, make us think of a ciliopathy when we see a patient in the clinic, especially a patient with multiple developmental anomalies. The second message is do not try to classify your patient into a specific ciliopathy syndrome at all costs, because this might not be possible in some cases. And we do have overlap phenotypes that are not classifiable in one group or the other. The important thing is just to describe the phenotype as best as, best as possible. Uh, due to this variability, of course, it doesn't make sense anymore to sequence single genes, even if there are some gene phenotype correlates. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, NGS-based uh, uh, targeted sequencing of ciliary genes or panels of genes, or probably in the near future, even a whole exome sequencing approach, and there are a few papers already going in this direction, is the strategy of choice that is the one uh, most uh, cost-effective to uh, um, diagnose patients with ciliopathy and probably will also allow to expand the spectrum of phenotypes associated with specific genes. Uh, although uh, several causative genes still remain unknown, as you've all seen, we, pro we hope that this will be identified soon uh, through NGS studies in uh, mutation negative families, so even rare genes will have to be identified. And my personal feeling, opinion, is that the research on phenotypic modifiers still represent the biggest challenges, challenge that ciliopathy research has to face at the moment to eventually uh, improve counseling and also help reproductive choices for families. And uh, this is all. Thank you for your attention.